everyone, and welcome back to Fast 40 Presents Start Here, the podcast. I'm your host, Carrie Ingram. I am not joined by Erica Avery today because we're doing a weird quick intro and outro for today's podcast episode. Erica and I got to sit down last week and chat with one of our close colleagues, someone who I chat with every single week. And honestly, it's mind-boggling how they haven't been on the podcast until now. Um, We got to chat with Madison Marks, the director of the Social Innovation Lab here at Johns Hopkins. And such a great conversation came from that. Madison Marks is such a great colleague, first of all, and she has a vast amount of experience in the entrepreneurship realm, specifically not even on U.S. soil. She has made the Social Innovation Lab into a really great program since she started back in 2020 when we were still virtual and in the middle of a pandemic. So here is our chat with Madison Marks from last week. We hope you guys enjoy this. We had a really great time learning more about Madison, her background, what she used to do before SIL, and what she's doing now to really help the Baltimore ecosystem and beyond. Welcome, Madison, to our podcast. We're really excited to have you on here. It's been a long time coming. I always start off with the first question being the same for everyone that we talk to. So I just want to know, Who are you and what do you do? Sure. My name is Madison Marks and I'm the director of the Social Innovation Lab at Johns Hopkins University. We sit under Johns Hopkins Technology Ventures and our mission is to support mission-driven ventures and leaders to create sustainable change with a measurable impact here in Baltimore and beyond. And how did you come to be a part of SIL? Sure. So the Social Innovation Lab, which we refer to as SIL or SIL, depending upon (laughs) which era of SIL you've been in, um, has it has been around for over a decade now. Um, and so it is part of the university formally. So there's one director and then a programming budget that we use to support the accelerator annually. So we, we take 10 companies um, annually who will be going through a rigorous program. But in answer to your question, I've been working in the accelerator and entrepreneurship space for the last four years more formally. Um, but I've been running programs that are more innovation and and, um, student oriented for about eight. And so when I saw this opportunity coming up, which basically was a mesh of my passion for impact work, um, working with entrepreneurs and getting to know an ecosystem and being able to support its social innovators, that was what attracted to me about this job. And and so I was really blessed to be able to come over and work here um, to support entrepreneurs in Baltimore. That's awesome. We're really happy to have you on our team. And I, I kind of want to backtrack. I feel like I'm all over the place. It's only two minutes in. But before we start talking more about details with SIL, I'd love to kind of know, like, what was your journey getting into entrepreneurship? Um, what was your experience like when you were in college? Um, and how did you get from that point all the way to Madison Marks of SIL today? Sure, that's a great question. Um, it's not a linear path, as I think any entrepreneur would say. So I did my undergraduate in Middle East studies. So I studied Arabic and I was very much about working in international development within the Middle East. And so I actually spent time in the Middle East, but it was when I was working in the Middle East during a period of time where there was protests sweeping the Arab world and youth were protesting because they didn't have access to opportunities. Um, There was a, there's macro issues, but one of the big issues was Um, access to viable work opportunities so that youth could be able to contribute um, and and build lives for themselves. So that was actually my first interest in entrepreneurship was how can you create opportunities for youth to be able to engage meaningfully in society and and have incomes for themselves, but also supporting others. And so that as a research question kind of drove my shift after four years. And I was working in Washington, D.C. um, with a, a global foundation. And then I moved into entrepreneurship strategically. I had a master's paid for at Georgetown um, in Arab studies, and I wanted to make it work for business. So I just decided to enroll in every entrepreneurship or business course I could take. And then I did an accelerator program, which I consider accelerator was called hacking for defense. And it was a very intensive semester long class where we went through lean startup methodology week by week to solve a problem that was issued by a government agency. And so that experience was really transformative and I wanted to be in the, in the space of working with companies um, to solve problems and really understand what their value proposition was. So that's why I shifted into the incubator and accelerator space. 
And then I moved, you know, logically, how do you do that? You move across the world um, on a one-way ticket to Dubai, where I was able to work with a number of different funders and accelerator operators who were doing everything from launching the first female-focused tech accelerator program in the region to working on bringing in smart city-oriented startups and sustainable ventures and to Dubai to register and grow and do business there to the last role before I came here, which was supporting global innovators for um, what is called the World Expo. The World Expo is like the World Fair of the 21st century. And so they had allocated $100 million to support innovators globally. So I was supporting the programming integration of all of those social innovators they had invested in into the overall event. So very diverse experience. Um, but um, after working on the on the tech startup side, I knew how to run programs and been in marketing. And, and so this role was a little bit of everything. And so I figured why not bring what I've seen in terms of best practices at the international scale to see how we can better this program here in Baltimore. Awesome. I, I always love hearing the overview of everything that you've done prior to this time, because I think it's amazing how well ingrained you have been in the entrepreneurship ecosystem, but not just locally in Baltimore. Um, so it's always interesting to hear the layers behind everything that you've done and continue to do. Um, but I'll pass it over to Erica for a question. Sorry, Erica, I didn't mean to cut Absolutely. you off. No, not at all. So I was reading that throughout the year 2020 that you had lived in Jordan and Lebanon and had worked with uh, some different um, businesses. So I was wondering, what was it like to be over there and to have like your boots on the ground there and what kind of work you were doing with them? Sure. So in terms of the types of entrepreneurs I worked with, they've all typically been very early stage. So um, I've worked with some programming that helps people get to an MVP, a minimal viable product, but the majority of entrepreneurs I've worked with have already built something. So either an MVP or have, you know, edition one or version one of what they're building and really want to take it to the next level. They need funding, mentorship, um, technical assistance, and access to resources to be able to do so. My time in Jordan and Lebanon was more so when I was spending time on the ground. I speak the, the dialect fluently. When I was there, I was working with more short-term contract projects, so like leading Arabic programs for the State Department or working on running funded initiatives to better civil society and, and innovation uh, projects that would support activists across the Middle East. So those were short-term projects. But then from Dubai, I still worked in, in mentored startups at the regional scale. And so a lot of what I was doing was understanding what are the challenges and opportunities for entrepreneurs in the ecosystem, given it's a the Middle East is a strange place because there's uh, periods of stability and periods of instability, which impacts investment and the potential for startups to scale. And so what was interesting about being placed in the United Arab Emirates in Dubai was that a lot of entrepreneurs would actually grow out of um, Jordan or Lebanon and come to register in Dubai because it was a little bit more stable when it came to um, business operations, a little bit more advanced sometimes, but also there was more access to investors and hopes for, uh, for growing business. That said, the cost of doing business was much greater than being in the country. And sometimes the growth, the actual growth on the ground happened in the countries. So you would hire your back-end technical um, team. So there's a lot of companies in, in the Middle East that would have their, their back office of finance be in Lebanon or their back office of engineers be in Jordan because there's such a high percentage of the population that's skilled, but it's also cost of, uh, cost of labor is, um, is cheaper than in other places. You know, you still can get companies, for example, like Yahoo um, and others would set up back offices in, in countries. Um, they would still pay uh, significantly higher, but they would be able to get the best of the best in terms of technical talent. So it's it, it's producing uh, opportunities for for people to grow beyond uh, what's in their countries because they're, they're relatively small countries. So um, yeah, it was interesting, but I think there's ties to Baltimore because when you're in a very small ecosystem that's trying to define itself based on the resources in the area. So for example, Baltimore has an incredible amount of human capital. You've got some of the world's leading institutions in a very concentrated area, a lot of technical talent, a lot of focus on cybersecurity or healthcare, um, biotech, these types of things. And so 
leveraging your brand as a startup ecosystem is really important. So I saw a lot of what was happening here in Baltimore, similar in smaller countries where they were trying to figure out how can we attract more business here based on the the strengths of the, the community and population we have and the resources here. Baltimore, for example, is now trying to brand itself as the Equitech capital. So a place where, you know, uh, diverse talent can be hired, where there is a, a lot of potential when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging types of innovations in general. It's been cool to see some of those best practices that I learned working in smaller ecosystems uh, working here. And, and I think Baltimore is, is next on the stage when it comes to a hub for uh, different types of innovation. And so it's been cool to translate that that experience in smaller ecosystems to Baltimore. That was an excellent answer. Like every time I had a follow-up question, you like immediately <laughs> answered it. That was awesome. For SIL, like what kinds of things could you take away from your experiences in the Middle East that you could apply um, for your position currently? A couple of things. So one is it, like skills and, and relevant experience. I apply a lot of what I've seen in terms of models of, for example, this year we're testing out a, a model because I've seen that entrepreneurs need support with governance. And so I was part of a, a group that was a, a social impact accelerator working across Africa and the Middle East that did simulations last year for board meetings. It was really effective. Um, so I'm applying that here in Baltimore with this current social innovation lab cohort. But there's a lot of challenges in the Middle East because Baltimore's challenges are so entrenched in, um, you know, when it comes to everything from violence to, you know, health inequities, food insecurity. Um, I've seen a lot of that in places where the refugee populations can be 25% of your population. It sounds weird, but nothing shocks me anymore after living in the Middle East. And so I've seen it all, we've been exposed, you know, to some of the darkest parts of humanity um, that impact populations. And it does so here. So I think in terms of being empathetic, but also the resilience that entrepreneurs have, because at the end of the day, these people, many of them don't ever have opportunities to go outside you know, they'll be lucky if they can move to a larger city and, and build a, a company that's more sustainable. They don't have access to friends, family, fools network, right? That is going to fund them. Um, they might be spending a year negotiating over like a $50,000 investment, which in Silicon Valley, they hear, oh, people write million dollar checks over coffee, which isn't true, but it has, you know, there's, there are those stories. And so when it comes to um, equitable access, uh, when it comes to financial access, um, when it comes to just exposure to different markets and what they're doing, I think there's a lot of similarities that I can see within Baltimore. And so, so trying to figure out how do you connect these entrepreneurs, because there's only so many resources you can get in your specific city or in your state. So how do you give them the tools to show showcase what they're doing at a national level so they're bringing in more attention? And I think that's what's been impactful for a lot of SIL especially community entrepreneurs, they have gone out and they've proven, you know, it takes time in the Baltimore ecosystem for there to be a stamp of approval for funders. And, um, and so these entrepreneurs do everything they should check, check box. They, they go through a social innovation lab, they go through another fellowship, they go through another accelerator, they do a national fellowship, or they get on some sort of national platform where they're sharing their story. And suddenly that's when people who might have been telling them no for years suddenly start saying, oh, let me think about partnering. Um, and so it's, it's a long game with the Silicon Valley mentality or even Dubai, there's a lot of short-term interventions, but the long game of, okay, this is about systemic change. This is about creating pathways for others behind me. It's not just about becoming the next unicorn company. Is really impactful. So I see the same level of heart and also real experiences that influence the why behind what entrepreneurs are doing. One of the unique things about SIL is it's not just nonprofit. It's not just for-profit. We just accept leaders where they are and we say, okay, you'll figure out how to build sustainable businesses and we'll help you figure out how to measure your impact. Um, whether you're registered as a 501c3 nonprofit or an LLC or you have a hybrid or you're a fiscal sponsor, let's figure out how you can build revenue lines so that you can offset your costs from grants and, and not be as grant dependent. 
But at the end of the day, you need to be able to be flexible in order to get the type of capital you need to make an impact here. So it just takes time. And so we, you know, I, I'm just encouraging entrepreneurs to be as smart as possible about their business plans, but know, you know, when they need to pivot and have the resources and the, the groundwork set so that they're able to adapt as we're moving forward beyond the program. Yeah, and that, that sparks a lot of questions for me. Um, and branching off of that, with SIL, you are in a unique position where all of the entrepreneurs that you get to speak with, whether it be the people who are in your cohort or the people who have applied, they have this mission that they're really trying to move forward with. And that must be a difficult job to try and narrow down whose missions are the ones that you're going to work with each year. Um, so with that, have you noticed there being any type of pattern of teams, either teams who have not been able to get into the cohort or teams who have, but they haven't had as much business acumen. Are there any holes that you commonly see in people who are so focused on the social mission um, that they kind of forget this part of business when it comes to moving forward, if that makes sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's a couple of different types of companies we see apply to the program. So we have companies that are brand new. Um, so they started with an idea and they've been building traction over the, com the couple of months and now they wanna move forward and accelerate. So maybe they built a prototype or they started a pilot program and now they're, they say, okay, we saw some traction, people came, people donated, whatever that might be, let's move forward. Um, so people who are coming who are fresh with the idea. Then we also have a category of people who have been working on this for, idea for a while. They may not be full-time on it. In fact, many of our entrepreneurs are moonlighting. So they're either full-time parents, students, workers, and then do this on the side, but they really want to take it to the next level. So, and they want to learn the basic skills they need in order to strengthen their business so that they're taken more seriously by funders, by programs and initiatives beyond. And then we also have a third category, which is people who've been doing this work for many years who uh, might've been doing it out of passion, um, but they realize in order to survive or in order to maintain their sanity, they need to create operational structures that will give them space to strategize rather than doing everything themselves. Moving beyond that line of you've been responding for so long, they wanna kind of move to being more forward thinking and, and being able to plan so that they have the systems in place so when they do the funding they need or the, the customers they need to scale, they're ready to do so. So we saw that last year with companies like the Franciscan Center of Baltimore, um, which has been a longstanding soup kitchen. It's been around for 50 plus years. They are starting to think more creatively about how they can leverage different types of funding and um, it, increase their impact from just a soup kitchen to being a community kitchen to launching an elevated a, a brand of elevated soups. Um, we have a company this year called Ballet After Dark, who has been doing this work for seven years, has, has been sustained, um, you know, the founder has been able to sustain herself, um, but now wants to move to the next level and is thinking about doing an LLC that will take what they're doing to, to the next level, be able to access venture funding, but then be able to reinvest, reinvest those funds into the core of the mission, which is the impact um, where they support um, survivors of sexual assault and trauma through uh, through dance and movement. These entrepreneurs are coming to us at different stages. We've had a trend of entrepreneurs who will apply with an idea. They may get to the interview stage, we give them feedback and we tell them, hey, go out and do this, come back to us next year. And surprisingly, a lot of them are in this for the long, long term. So they come back and they say, here's what I did. And this year we had, um, three of our 10 companies that actually applied last year, interviewed, may have been at the like top five in terms of alternates. And we said, hey, we think you need a little bit more traction. Go out and build your brand or go out and uh, pilot something. Come back to us. And they did. And uh, we also honor, not saying in every case, but we also honor effort and see that commitment level from entrepreneurs over time. So it's you know, SIO wants to add value at every step of the process. If you don't get into the program, we try our best to provide feedback. If you get into the program, you know, obviously there's a lot of impact, but, we, but even beyond the program, which is what we're looking at next is the alumni network, um, is how do we add value to our alumni in a meaningful way, given the capacity levels we have right now, it's a one person team, plus fast forward, you being able to support entrepreneurs. So we're doing things like trying to build more cohesive partnerships across Baltimore 
to be able to support our alumni. But the reality is our alumni, and when I say our alumni, I'm referring to a majority of those who've been community-based entrepreneurs um, since 2016, they are going on to other programs. So they're shared and joint with other ecosystem partners. So it's more of an ecosystem conversation around how do we support these entrepreneurs to be able to get the, the funding they need at, or the right mentorship at the right time so that they don't have to apply for an, another accelerator program or another fellowship program um, that distracts them from the work that they need to be doing in actually building their companies. Awesome. And if you could have one piece of advice that you give to social impact teams, what would it be as far as either getting into SIL or moving on beyond SIL? Yeah, so I would say social impact teams, as they're looking to apply, first of all, consider it a learning opportunity every single time. Don't consider it personal if you don't get in. It, it is not. Sometimes it's just about the right fit and, and numbers, but also come to the interview showing traction. So go out and interview people yourself with customer discovery to get a sense of what people actually want. Accelerator programs like the Social Innovation Lab are becoming even more and more competitive each year. The, we see the quality of companies um, rising. And so as they become more competitive, you also need to be more in the mindset of, okay, you know, let me do my research, build relationships with, um, with the accelerator leaders before application periods, get feedback. One thing I've done, and we had a couple of entrepreneurs that um, we just didn't have space for, we only had 10 slots this year, but I've tried to introduce them to the right networks so that they can get into other programs, they can benefit from other incubator and acceleration programs. It's also about you know, being willing to ask for feedback, ask for who else should I know about um, and get, you know, as much as possible, try to leverage the knowledge and when you're in meetings to, to say, who else should I, I reach out to and then go after those relationships. We find entrepreneurs who think they're coming into a program and are going to be told what to do. The best entrepreneurs at Social Innovation Lab are going out and finding solutions. We're helping them along the way and coaching them but they're taking advantage of every opportunity and they're going out on their own. So self-driven entrepreneurs who are around other self-driven entrepreneurs uh, create incredible um, amounts of community and support for one another. And so that would be my advice for early stage entrepreneurs. But if you are starting a project or if you are starting an initiative or if you're starting a company, think about it in terms of a business operation. How do you, what is your end goal? What is the impact you want to have? How are you going to achieve that? What are the resources you need? And build a project plan and follow it and measure your impact. So how much time and money are you spending on this? Who do you need? Who are the partners? It's not just about competitors. It's about collaborators in the impact space. Who is already in the space that you need to talk to to understand? Because maybe you don't need to build that solution. Maybe you need to come under another company who's already doing the work. Figure out how you can actually add value to the end users and to the impacted uh, communities and go there um, and, and work with people who are on the ground and have trust, especially in a city like Baltimore. Trust and relationships and family are so important. And so you gotta work with people who are on the ground. And I think that's why the Social Innovation Lab has been successful in building the community, especially among Baltimore entrepreneurs. Our entrepreneurs are rooted in the community. They're coming from Baltimore um, or they come in and they build trust. They understand like Bree Jones from Parity. She came in and she saw a vision for Baltimore with its number of abandoned buildings and homes to create Parity, a real estate development firm that de does development without displacement. She has built, spent years and years building relationships with funders, partners, mentors, and she has shown, she's shown up. So she's also changed legislation in the States. She's one of you know, every, I say I want to be Brie Jones when I grow up. <laughs> so she's amazing. She's understood the ecosystem. She's studied and she's been patient. So she knows when to push and when to kind of sit back and, and look. So don't always assume you can come in and make an impact immediately. It Think, think of the long game. Um, so any listeners out there um, for them who might be hearing this and interested in the Social Innovation Lab, uh, how can they get in touch with you and start that process? Sure. So you can um, get in touch with us. Our email is on the um, JHTV website. So 
It's very simple, jhtv-sil at jhu.edu. You can also follow us on Instagram at the Social Innovation Lab, and uh, we are responsive. So on social media, email, um, and our applications for the Social Innovation Lab open every September. So look out for that. And we also, if you're a student at Hopkins, we also run annual boot camps. And our office is located at Fast Forward U, so stop by, um, schedule an appointment to be able to meet. I'm always happy to think with you about how you can make an impact. So whether that's looking at organizations you can volunteer with in town or thinking about how you can build something um, from the ground up that really has an impact on um, on the communities that you're intending to target. Awesome, thanks Madison. Well, it was really nice picking your brain for the one of the first hours of the day. Um, I appreciate you sitting down and chatting with us about yourself and about the Social Innovation Lab. We're really excited to continue to see what the SIL cohort of this year is doing. And you have your cohort end date being in April? Yes, April 26th. So we are still waiting on um, whether it will be open to the public to the level that um, we've had in the past. But it probably will be a hybrid, so everyone can join online. Um, and if you really want to, to attend in person, then reach out to me. I'm happy to send an invite. Awesome. And I'll make sure to leave your links and your email address in the podcast information box um, after this episode. But thank you so much, Madison. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. That was awesome. Yeah, have a great day. And, and remember, you can make an impact wherever you are. All right, guys. So I am back. Usually Erica and I do fave finds. So I am going to give you guys two fave finds since it's just me that you're listening to at this moment in time. My first fave find, well, both of them are a little biased and a little bit of a plug-in, if I may. But the first one is going to be the Fast Forward U Summer Incubator. This is our first time ever running a incubator program in the middle of the summertime. And we are going to be allowing for 20 JHU student entrepreneurs to get free room and board and a stipend to live and use our co-working space to work on their venture full time during the summer. So that's really exciting. Our application's just opened, which is why it's my first fave find. And my second fave find is another application that just opened from us. And it is our annual innovation and entrepreneurship challenge. This challenge is composed of multiple awards that both Johns Hopkins University student entrepreneurs and alums can apply for, for funding, and we're giving away over $170,000 this year, our biggest year yet. We have added a new prize to this prize pool, and it is called the Alumni Venture Award, and it is specifically a $20,000 grant for alumni. So I will leave that information in our description for this week's podcast so you guys can make sure to check that out as well. The application for the Summer Incubator Program is rolling until we fill the 20 spots, but the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Challenge application is open until March 1st. So make sure that you apply fast. But those are the two fave finds for the week. Thank you guys so much for listening to this week's episode and make sure to stay tuned on Apple Podcast for future episodes to come. We upload every other week. We have some amazing entrepreneurs that we speak with on the regular that we'd love to get on this podcast so you can pick their brains more too. And if you have any entrepreneurs you'd like us to speak with or questions you'd like us to start asking, be sure to leave those in the comments. But with all that being said, thank you guys so much for listening. I'm Carrie Ingram, and this is Fast Forward You. Start here. I said I don't wanna 44 a year, but I think that I'm gonna hit you up and try to tell you I love you. If I wait any longer, then I think I might suffer. I think I found out that I need you.